You're listening to the Popoto Pub Final Fantasy XIV podcast with your host, Popo Jagaimo. Well, lolly ho, everyone. Welcome back to the sixth episode of the Popoto Pub Final Fantasy XIV podcast. I'm joined here today by my guest, Crystal, the very aptly named Crystal for a game like Final Fantasy XIV. Thank you for being here. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> so I was a, a fan of Crystal's um, back when you were streaming Persona 5, which, funny enough, is a game that is feels very similar in a lot of ways in terms of the story of Final Fantasy XIV. But could you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, what you do, if they don't know who you are? Uh, go ahead and give us the yeah. uh, the Crystal story. All right. Well, hi. Yeah, I'm Crystal. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm a streamer, gamer, dancer, model, cosplayer, content creator. I do a lot of things different things but uh in terms of gaming i focus on jrpgs mainly so i like playing story-based games and uh yeah that's that's where that's basically my whole life <laughs> since so, i was a little girl sounds like it sounds like a wonderful life honestly so a whole bunch of things <laughs> so how did you get involved with final fantasy 14 was it something that you've picked up recently is it something you've been playing for a long period of time like what's your ff14 yeah. journey been like i started final fantasy 14 five years ago it was shortly after i started streaming um i started streaming and i was mainly like a cosplay content creator for a long time because i didn't have a pc to game at the time and then as soon as i got a pc i was like a variety streamer for a couple months and then I was a long time Final Fantasy fan. Like I grew up, my first Final Fantasy was Final Fantasy VII whenever I was, I was like 10 or 11 years old. I played it at too young basically because <laughs> I didn't understand any of it. So I got into Final Fantasy VII and then I was like, I really love this game. So I wanted to try all the other Final Fantasies and I knew I would love Final Fantasy XIV. <laughs> So I had played every numbered Final Fantasy game and I was like, okay, well, 11 and 14 are the last ones on my list. So I started playing 14 whenever I knew I could get addicted to the game because I knew that getting into the game would like, I'd be selling my soul basically. Uh, so I chose a time in my life to get into it whenever I knew I can just go to town and invest a lot of time. So that was about five years ago. And then I just streamed it for about three years before I started getting into the Persona world. That was two years ago. So yeah, I've been a long time fan and player of Final Fantasy XIV and I just, I feel like I owe this game all my money. Like I just, I, <laughs> I can't imagine ever dropping my sub. Like it's so nice to just log in after, you know, I'll play like a JRPG and then I'll come back to Final Fantasy XIV and I'll play it for a while. But it's a nice game that you can just come back to every so often. And I just have so much love and joy for the game in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's like, done a, a lot for me. like your home in a way. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's exactly that. It's my home game. So I play some Final Fantasy patch and then I come back, I go and play a different JRPG and just kind of like flip and flop. So, so what was your, um, you said Final Fantasy seven, funny enough, you and I have like an almost identical story in terms of like our <laughs> Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy seven was my first Final Fantasy. And I want to say it was my first JRPG too, and that I played, um, that might be a bit of a stretch. Super Mario RPG, I think might've been the first one that I played on, on the Super Nintendo. That's a, that's a legit JRPG and that's a good one. <laughs> so... So, but it was like kind of hidden under that that layer of like not being a Final Fantasy game or one of these uh, games that everyone fantasy star that everyone kind of knew about. But seven mm -hmm. seven changed my life. I, I can't recall. I was probably around twelve at the time when I played seven, and my okay, friend, yeah. my be my best friend and I were on the phone like calling each other long distance. If you remember that antiquated thing where you had to pay people <laughs> or pay to per minute to call your friend who lived in the opposite area code. And yep. uh, oh, yeah. made my parents quite angry because uh, we <laughs> yep. racked up the I phone bill. That. But it was like the early days of Discord. Just, you know, hey, man, where are you at in Final Fantasy VII? Oh, did you just see what happened? Um, so it was like it was like we were streaming to each other without the actual visuals, but we were communicating the whole time as we're playing a single-player JRPG with one another. So it was a kind of a oh. wild time. 
So yeah, you- I have similar like really good memories with Seven. Just really young. My brother is the one that introduced me to it. I don't think it was my official first JRPG. Is Legend of Zelda? No, it's not really a JRPG. I wouldn't put it in that no, classification. No, yeah, it's not really. I mean, it, so it's- maybe it was my first official. I never really thought about that because I know Legend of Zelda was like my first video game ever whenever I was a kid. But yeah, actually, I think it might be. <laughs> That's wild. So, so you picked up FF14 about five years ago. That was during Heaven's Word? Um, I came in uh, shortly after Stormblood launched. Okay. So it was toward the end of that uh, expansion because like four, I think it was 4.1 was going to come out. So like the next patch was like just coming out and I, I just got to end game before that patch was releasing. So yeah, just like shortly after Stormblood was my first time. Okay, so obviously you're a big MSQ fan. We I've seen the stream, so uh, I've been right there with you. I'm not comfortable enough yet to show myself on stream going through that journey, but I will say that, you know, it's funny. Everyone says, like, FF14 is kind of a boring game to stream or whatever, mm-hmm. or a boring game for people to watch. Um, and I, it's funny because it's the literally the game that got me kind of into streaming and into, oh. like, actually watching streamers. That will Persona 5, too. Um, but, you know... Aside from that, it's just, I think I enjoy going through the journey with other people and seeing, you know, if their reactions are very similar to my reactions that I had, because I I will say at the end of 5.3, I was a mess for about 30 minutes straight. And to to quote Zeppla, I wasn't, I wouldn't have been comfortable showing myself going through that journey on camera. So kudos to all of you that that are able to do that. Um, Yeah. But yeah, so, you know, what are your favorite things to do in 14, like, as far as streaming goes? Um, or it just maybe just your general gameplay? Is it pure MSQ? Is it MSQ and leveling alt jobs? Is it housing? Is it the RP stuff? <laughs> like, what do, you, what do you enjoy doing in the game? Primarily raiding. So I actually joined Final Fantasy 14. Not necessarily for the story, but I'm one of those people that really like a a challenge in games. I used to do that with like every JRPG. I used to love getting to end game and doing like those extra super bosses in all the games. I I always love that. So a friend of mine told me that raiding in Final Fantasy XIV was really fun. So I was like, okay, well, that sounds like a great thing because I can do MSQ and enjoy the story and have fantastic endgame content that I would totally be into. So yeah, um, primarily raiding is like my favorite thing to do. What I used to do uh, whenever I used to just stream Final Fantasy XIV before I became a variety content creator, I would just be one of those streamers that uh, helped people out in Party Finder. So if there was clear parties, I would just go on whatever role was needed. Um, And I like being able to play every job. So I have every job up to max level. And then whenever I get a job up to max level, I go on a striking dummy and I learn the rotation and really get it engraved in my brain so that if somebody needs like a dragoon or a healer or a tank or whatever, I'm ready to go and I can do all those roles. Um, But yeah, so I, I go on Party Finder and every week I try to do a different role for my weekly two chests and for the for the raid tier uh it's really hard because whenever you play all these different jobs gearing all of them is a pain in the butt (laughs) so i try to stick to healing because i feel like uh healer healers and tanks are always what parties are looking for primarily so i focus on getting those two jobs uh up to bis or as much as i can get up to bis and then yeah, just kind of fill where people need help with. Like, I have my favorite jobs that I do like playing, but I'm okay with exploring other things. Like, I love the fact that I have this one character in the game and I can do anything on it. And I like taking advantage of that. Like, I just love helping people out and being that flex player that can do anything you need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's one of the big draws. I'm I'm a WoW refugee, if you didn't know. So <laughs> yeah. I I'm, I, uh, I actually started playing towards the end of Stormblood, like shortly before Shadowbringers is when I, okay. I picked up the game. Um, but I basically just MSQ'd it and then kind of finished it up and was like, yeah, I'm still raiding in Warcraft and whatever. And <laughs> coming over from Warcraft, I don't know if you have any history with Warcraft, but coming over know. from Warcraft, one of the, I think the best changes is that in Warcraft, there's like, 
12 different classes and they are all okay. separate characters, right? So all of your progress and everything does not track from character to character. The gear that you oh. get cannot be used on things. And when I came over here, I was like, someone was like, yeah, you just have one character pretty much. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> what a culture shock. <laughs> yeah. And then, and I'm like, what, you mean this piece of trash gear that I, you know, the RNG or RNGs just didn't, bl didn't bless me with the right drop for that week. You mean to tell me I can actually use that on an alt job? <laughs> get, yeah, it's, get, get out sure of town very different for you <laughs> yeah so I'm, I'm very much the same way so you have everything at, at 90 now or are you still I'm working, working towards on that? it right now I have about half of the jobs to 90 I've been working really hard on crafters and gatherers actually for the past like two weeks I've been going mm -hmm. super ham gotcha yeah I'm I'm I've got two left to get to 90 so I'm in the same boat as you so I've got <laughs> ninja I'm finishing ninja tonight uh I only have two more levels to go on ninja and I have all my roulettes ready to go so I'll, I'll make that tonight and then I have just yeah. samurai left uh after that so oh you end with the melees I see <laughs> yeah I'm not you know what's funny is because I came from like warcraft where I actually preferred playing melee all the time and here Whenever I think about playing melee, I'm like, I just might as well just play a tank because like I like all the tanks better than than all the the melees. Yeah. Maybe not thematically. Like I love samurai and I I love ninja and monk and all of them thematically. Dragoons amazing uh, thematic thing. My favorite melee. I just I just don't enjoy the rotation. Also, and this is this is really common in mind. It's like little secret. Uh, <laughs> that, that I'm telling everybody, so it's no longer a secret. <laughs> <laughs> is is tanking. You can take like three vulnerability stacks and be like, okay. And I don't know, melee, mm -mm. That, that doesn't happen. So, <laughs> so it's more like idiot protection is, is why I play tank most of the time. But then I, I have my scholar <laughs> yeah. and my uh, summoner too as my my other two mains. But yeah, um, so mm -hmm. I'm I'm almost back to what I'm calling omni popoto status, which is you know getting everything capped. <laughs> um, Being able to do everything. <laughs> yeah, I have not touched. Well, I, I shouldn't say I've I've. 81 on cooking but all my crafters are still sitting at 80 and i and i haven't touched fishing since work. since shadowbringer so that's next on my agenda but yeah that that yeah. altaholism is is running strong uh over here as well <laughs> yeah it's i feel bad because i haven't been able to like really play too much off stream because i am very busy so i'm very much like a casual leveler i'll just level in uh I'll log in every day and then I'll just do my dailies and then craft a little bit and that's my day. I've never really actively leveled, like grinded. I just do like the very slow grind every day just doing the dailies because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm not like in any rush to get everything to 90 because like, like I said before, whenever I get a job to 90, I like playing it in Party Finder and then in the raids. So that takes time in itself. And then when I get the next job, I do the same thing. And then yeah. so I like I like the slow grind. Yeah, I actually someone yesterday asked me or not yesterday, a couple days ago asked me on my very first stream. Uh, I was just doing a roulette stream because that's what I enjoy doing. And I wanted to run roulettes with with people that, that subscribe to the channel and, and other people. And, uh, you know, one of the people asked me, like, how did you get to that point? I'm like, just slow and steady the whole time. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't try to go crazy palace of the dead, you know, like have spreadsheets of what's the optimal calculation of leveling and all that type of stuff. Like, do I do Bajja? Yeah. Do I do dungeon spamming? What do I do? I'm like, I just enjoy doing the roulettes and I just do them every day. And it's like, you get a couple levels a day and it adds up over time. Yeah, um, exactly. Like do the dailies. I'll do some things with friends, which what if, if that's sometimes like doing the, the fates in each of the new maps, cause that's really good for gemstones and leveling. Mm -hmm. And then, um, also doing the trust system because I want to level up all the characters in the trust system. So if I have any extra time, I'll do those things to level and get the extra benefits. But yeah, it's nice that there's like a wide variety of ways to level in the game that it doesn't, I never feel like I'm grinding because I just have so many options that I could do. Yeah. So are you in the savage raids now? So you said, you said you're yeah. interested in raiding, doing the savage yeah. raids. How do you feel about the, uh, the savage or I guess P1S or the PS. Raids, I right? love this tier a lot. Um, so I've done every raid in the game. So I'm like very, like I'm very familiar with like most mechanics in the game. And I got to say like this tier in particular, I really think the balance was done really well. Like from the first tier, the second tier, and then the jump, there's always a jump from the, the second to the third fight in every tier. 
I just think the balance was just so well done. And whenever I play it on tank healer DPS, like all the roles individually are fun. And yeah, I feel like P1S is the first fight in a raid tier that we've had that's like a really good entry fight for beginning raiders that we've had in a very long time. Yeah. Because some uh, some of these first fights in the tiers are just <laughs> they're uh, not so fun. They're not they're quite a slog. <laughs> <laughs> and very hard to do in party finders. So uh yeah, I feel like they really nailed this tier a lot personally. Yeah, I'm this really is really happy with it. This is my first time actually doing any end game stuff, right? Like I, I said, it oh was, yeah, I was an MSQ Andy. Uh, Sarah Jane told me like she's an MSQ Andy, like just kind of do the <laughs> MSQ for a while and and do that. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I got to the end of Shadowbringers, like I love the story, but at the time mentally, I just couldn't commit to two MMOs and trying to end game both That's of them. Lot. Yeah, it's it's way too much. Um, so I kind of just put it away for a while and then came back to it and and got caught up. Uh, with the MSQ, but this is the first time I'm doing any like true end game content in terms of the raids and whatnot. And I will say oh. the the four fights that on normal, not on Savage, haven't dipped in, <laughs> dipped my toes in there just yet are a blast. <laughs> like coming from mythic rating in Warcraft, which is the highest difficulty over there to, mm -hmm. to this, you know, just the mechanics and the flow of the fights and the fights are much longer over here, but the mechanics are, oh. are very... I don't want to say telegraphed, but they're, they're, if you know what you're doing and you know what the icons mean and everything and you're comfortable with everything, you can kind of learn the pattern. And I always yeah, feel like... Yeah, scripted too. Yeah, I feel like every fight, the more and more you get used to playing it, the better and better you get. So there's a constant progression, which yeah, I really like. Yeah, it feels like. really good. Yeah. And in Warcraft, the, the main difference is like you could get wiped out, you know, as one of your like 20 people or whatever, 15 people in a raid. Um and have no idea what happened to you. <laughs> and here it's oh, like, really? yeah, here it's like they built in mechanics to where you kind of know, like when you messed up, you get that vulnerability stack and you know, you kind of <laughs> yeah. messed up and then you, then you can battle res too, right? You can res people in the middle of a fight in Warcraft. There's only two, three, three characters that three classes that can res. Um, Oh, wow. I didn't know that. In combat. And you're only limited to one per fight, or I believe it's two in, in the, the, the larger party. So it's a lot more unforgiving. So there's a lot of times where you're just like, oh, we died. Well, everyone just, just jump off a cliff. And and, oh, and here, wow. here, here it's just, it feels like there's a natural progression to it. Like no fights ever really truly over. Uh, kind of like if you've seen that yeah. video of the mm -hmm. warrior who soloed uh, uh, Eric Thonius. Um, Oh, yes, I did see that. <laughs> I, I had my own little moment on my warrior like that the other day in, in uh, Dead Ends. I soloed the second boss in there from like 80% after everyone else died right away. And yeah. I was I was like, this is fun. So no fight's yeah. ever really over. So it feels a lot more forgiving in that respect too. But mm -hmm. I do like the variety with each job, like, you know, having your red mage have like a little mini cure and a raise and your summoner like all the party utility i like i just like the balance of the game that like it's mm -hmm. not just on the healers to do their job but it's a group effort with everyone that has like their own special utilized skills that they can contribute to the party as a whole i just i don't know i really like it a lot <laughs> do you get into any of the other other things in the game so like the housing and and uh like the mute, maybe bard stuff. I don't know, like other things. Yeah. So I do have a house in game. I've been meaning to decorate it for years. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so bad because I know the housing struggle. I've gone through it three times because I've transferred my main character three times. So whenever you transfer your character, you lose your house. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. And I've had this medium house for a year and a half now. And it's just, I don't have the time and energy to put into, like, furnishing it. I probably should just hire somebody else to do it for Gil. <laughs> like, hey, decorate my house for me because I would like to actually do events in it. Um, <laughs> I do like having a house. The only thing I really do with it currently is garden. So at least mm -hmm. I utilize the gardening. Uh, that's pretty much <laughs> it. And I'm notorious for um, being very bad at glamming my character. Oh, really? 
Yeah, people, my friends like to make fun of me because in I, in real life, I'm very fashionable. But whenever it comes to in the video game, I just, I'm a glam disaster. <laughs> so like my glamour dresser is full and I have so many things in it. But whenever I put stuff together, I just don't know how to make my character look good in game. I, I feel- have like decent glams, but like I am such a raider in the game that like what can what people consider to be the true end game content of like housing and glamour i'm just so bad at interesting i feel like this is a very interesting psychological experiment like i have to understand how one can be very good at fashion in real life but not good at fashion in game because i well hmm. fantasy fashion is always so out there and it's um like what what works in a video game fashion wise does not equate to working in real life so a lot of the outfits that you see your characters wear, if a person in real life wears that, they're not going to look nearly as good. <laughs> so it doesn't always equate. So there is that factor. But yeah, I have thought about that a lot. Like, why do I struggle with <laughs> making my character look good? I mean, I can put out decent glams. Like, I'm not completely terrible sometimes. <laughs> but uh yeah i'm not definitely not the best glam person out there (laughs) well i have terrible fashion in real life and i'm good at glam so maybe there's just some wire that needs to be crossed right uh for you to be able to do the other one well (laughs) yeah and the other thing is i really want to get better at g posing too just taking pictures of my character in game my my friends always share their wars of light and this epic pictures and i just like don't know how to do that whole side of the game like i am I can tell you how to play every job and every raid in the game and I will walk you through everything. I'll teach you whatever mechanic you want to learn. But when it comes to like the basics, I just, (laughs) I'm a mess. (laughs) They they do say that's the true end game, right? Like once you get to that. So that's like the last frontier that you have to master. So yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. (laughs) It's probably good, honestly, that you that you weren't good at G posing and everything, because uh, in Endwalker, when they decided to let you be able to pose with the scions when they were walking around with you for those little bits, yeah, I, I had to stop myself because I was G posing with Alfie and Allie for Aww. probably the better part of like three hours, and I was like, well, I guess I'm not progressing the MSQ any today because because <laughs> this is all I'm doing, so. I want to do that more. Like, I want to take more G poses with my favorite characters. <laughs> yeah, I really, I don't think you can go back and actually G pose with the Scions unless you do like the New Game Plus thing and go through yeah. it all again. So I, I might have to do New Game Plus. I might have to do that at some point. I probably will once I figure out how to <laughs> G pose. Yeah. Eventually I'll get there. <laughs> So there's some some big news in the MMO world uh, the past couple weeks. Uh, obviously, uh, actor Microsoft acquired Activision Blizzard for like sixty nine or sixty seven point eight billion dollars or something obscene like that. Lots of um, money. <laughs> and now they own kind of two of the major players in the MMO market. They own ESO because they own Bethesda, and they now own or they will be owning World of Warcraft at some point. I have uh, a sneaking suspicion because Sony just acquired Bungie. uh, And I guess Destiny's kind of an MMO in a way. Um, Yeah, I'd consider it. It's a loose MMO, but it's kind of an MMO in a way. But, you know, Sony just acquired them for multiple billions of dollars. Do you think that Square Enix is next? I have a sneaking suspicion that I feel like someone's going to acquire Square Enix. and And I think it might be Sony. I don't. No. I f- they might, but I see Square wanting to stay independent. I don't know why though. Mm, they could. Do you think it would be a good thing? So, I mean, with all these these large companies starting to purchase all of these, you yeah. know, developers and everything to, you know, gain exclusivity or at least, you know, have them under their umbrella. Do you think that that's going to have a positive or negative impact on MMOs or potentially if if Square Enix got acquired, do you think that that would have a negative impact on Final Fantasy XIV? Hmm. A part of me, maybe it's wishful thinking. Uh, I do tend to have a more positive uh, outlook on things, but I, I think that if Sony did buy it, I don't think anything would actually change. 
because the core of the dev team would not change. And I highly doubt, especially with uh, Yoshi P's influence, I, I feel like any smart move would be like, hey, let this man do what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> and let's not influence it because clearly everything he has done has been enormously successful with the direction of the game that I, for some reason, I just don't feel like we would see an actual difference if they did buy Square Enix. Yeah. Maybe in other games' directions, but I don't feel in terms of 14 it would actually change. I've been telling everybody that we need to treat Yoshi P like our primal and give them all of our support so that <laughs> yeah. the, the corporate heads will not be able to affect him. We need to make sure he's as powerful as possible, or maybe I'm just uh, tempered. I don't know. This um, man deserves everything, everything good in life. Ugh. I hope that 16 is good. The The last couple of mm -hmm. Final Fantasy, like main series games that, that I've played, I haven't, I've, I've liked, but I haven't been yeah. super in love with, with any of the Final Fantasy games really since... 12 i want to say like 12 was great yeah. 10 10 and i like 10 too a lot too i thought both of those yeah. were really good the thir the 13 series mm, it has yeah. its ups and downs <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate the, the efforts that they tried with that and same thing with like 15 I like I appreciate the effort of trying something different but there's there's parts yeah. of me that just says I wish you would just go back to uh traditional turn-based combat because I really miss it. I do miss that. I I am like, because I grew up with turn-based combat, so I would love for it to go back in that direction. But I also am aware that uh, I hate that we're moving in an age where people just are too impatient with it these days. Mm -hmm. People don't like turn-based RPGs as much as they used to. Um, but I... I'm a little hesitant because I still don't have like a firm standpoint on it, but I, I think I did enjoy the combat in seven remake and i don't mind if they do more of that in the future because i thought how they handled the seven remake combat was done pretty well i don't really have like too big of complaints with it as a, even though i do miss the turn-based rpg and i do wish they kept it but <laughs> I, it's a personal want but i also realize that you know it's not the most popular thing at the end of the day unfortunately <laughs> yeah i mean it just it just feels strange because that seems like such a legacy thing with all jrpgs is the turn it is, combat yeah. system and so and it's so many kind of experiment with different things like i think 12 for me was a very successful experiment and riff off of the traditional kind of you stand over here you stand over here <laughs> <laughs> you run over and then you run back to your spot and attack the other team, you know, type of yeah. thing. I think it was a good spin, but there's some that are very kind of hit or miss. And I almost feel like just, yeah. just play it safe. I like, I like, uh, maybe I'm just an old man and I just like the, the turn. No, system, I'm, but. I'm completely with you. <laughs> I, I, that I would, I definitely wish for that as well. So you brought but I did like the 12. I did like 12's combat a lot, actually. Yeah, so you brought up an interesting point about patience when it comes to like turn-based combat mm -hmm. systems. And this is something that that really kind of fascinates me on the FF14 story, right? Because it is not your traditional MMO type of storytelling. It is a very Persona 5 JRPG Persona style of storytelling where it's almost like the JRPG to the extreme, <laughs> I would say. Because there yeah, are JRPGs that are like 50, 50 hours long, but then you get Persona 5 that's like, I don't know, 150 to <laughs> 200 hours long, your life. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's the way Too kind long. of, that's the way FF14 kind of feels. Mm -hmm. Why do you, why do you think that, you know, Persona 5 obviously was an incredibly successful, well-selling game. Um, Final Fantasy 14 was an incredibly popular game now. It's the, I guess it's the biggest MMO in the world at this point in time. Yeah. Why do you think they've been able to kind of like buck that trend and be able to say, screw it, we're just going to tell a 300, 400, 700 hour story and people are going to really like it and not be impatient with it when it seems like people's patience is really running thin these days? Honestly, that's a fantastic question that I ask myself, because when it when you hear JRPG, most people run away from it or run away from getting into the genre in general because they they hear JRPG and they're like, all right, 80 hour story game. Uh, I don't know if I can do that because like turn based RPG is a turnoff for a lot of people and like 
the lack of action because I feel like action is what holds people's attention. Um, but that's what I don't understand. <laughs> like, with in case of Persona 5 and even the other Persona games, like I've only played three and four, but they're all pretty long. Um, a five is definitely the longest, but the world building. I don't know what's so captivating about it because that's the big thing with 14 and Persona 5. Like, they focus on the slow build up, the world building. And then whenever you get to those climactic points, they're more impactful because you had time to really get invested into the world and in the characters specifically. And that is one of the strongest points I feel about both of the games individually, like 5 and um, 5 and 14. Like, the journey that you have with these characters. It's a bigger cast, but I also think that's what adds to it is like you're you're really journeying with this cast of characters for such a long period of time that the payoff for those action points are just so much more impactful to players as a whole. Um, now, a lot of times I feel like with JRPGs, like the journey isn't as memorable. Now, I'm not much of a storyteller or I don't I don't write, so I don't know how writing goes or how why certain things are successful and why they're not, but like um I I actually just had a conversation with someone earlier today. Like when I look at Xenoblade Chronicles, like I love those games a lot, but the for some reason and i don't know why but whenever i play xenoblade chronicles i like the game i think the game is good but none of it is memorable for me and i don't know why like i feel like the the character the the journey i have with the characters in the story it's a good story but i just don't remember it because it doesn't have any real impact for me and i i don't know what the difference is whether they they just don't create like a good enough world for me to get really invested in as I can get in with 14 and Persona series. I honestly don't know, but I think it's just, it comes down to like what everyone's cup of tea is. <laughs> yeah. Because people like certain things. Yeah. I mean, the long story, I'm sure, turns some people off, right? Like they get into it and they're like, oh, what, yeah. what do you mean? I have to sit here and read all this stuff? Like, what? Do, I'm not doing that. You're crazy. I just want to skip to the end. And then they skip to the end and they yeah. miss like the best parts of the game, in my opinion. Um, Especially when it's not voiced. That is a turnoff also for a lot of people. If it's not voiced, it's a lot less immersion too for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I'm one of those people that would love to have everything voiced. Uh, in persona <laughs> or or in 14 because i i love the voice actors just do such a, a tremendous job and i just they want do. want to hear their voice like i hear their voice when i'm reading mm -hmm. it in my head but at the same time I, yeah. I wish i could hear their their rendition and their performance of what they're trying to say um yeah it really adds a lot and um i think that's a lot of the big difference nowadays like jrpgs are getting more and more out there and i think that's actually um what i consider to be a bigger reason on why it's growing is because the voice acting is getting better and better like japanese has always nailed voice acting but like english voice acting has been kind of meh for at least the first like 10 15 years i was into gaming it was pretty like meh it was it wasn't the best voice acting but dubbing has honestly gotten so well like the voice actors are getting so much better and better with these video games i'm genuinely so surprised at the games that have come out in the past five years because i see such an increase in talent and um, enthusiasm in the voices. Like I feel a lot more it immersed in the voices lately in these games. Yeah. So I wish that would translate to older games, but too bad it doesn't. <laughs> I don't know if you ever watched the the interview with the voice actress that did Vanille in 13, but like she was no. talking about how she got all kinds of crazy direction, like how she went, ah! like they wanted her to make those sounds exactly the same way that just may not translate the wow. same way in like English. But they wanted yeah, to yeah. replicate it, you know, from the Japanese like feel and mm -hmm. and it almost seemed like it was like too much. Right. And so maybe they've relaxed a yeah. little bit to allow the the artist to kind of add a little bit more of their interpretation into it. Yeah. And I think that's actually a lot of what happened with Persona 5, because normally there's more of an audition process. But for from my understanding of Persona 5 those voice actors for most of the characters were reached out to like they reached out to max they were like hey you'd be a great ryuji they reached out to robbie like the of course there's like a mini audition but they had people in mind for these characters and they wanted the voice actors to run with it there was less direction and i think that is what works 
for games nowadays instead of like in, instead of giving actors the voice actors like too much direction which I feel like is what it used to be a little bit more but just having an idea giving it to the right person and then just letting them run wild because Max's performance is like fantastic <laughs> they just let him run and it worked out so well <laughs> yeah um so you know not to get into to much spoilers here i don't think this is a huge spoiler but there's a scene i think that encapsulates for me why the story in 14 and why the story in persona 5 like are so good right and why people yeah. connect with it so much and why people have these intense emotional reactions to mm -hmm. fictional characters sorry if that offends yeah. you like R ruri khan no like, no ruri khan seemed like he was ready to kill me when i said like these fictional characters were crying over saying goodbye to them and and like losing our minds he's like what do you mean they're fictional they're <laughs> <laughs> no they're real <laughs> they're my friends what are you talking about but i i think i think <laughs> m my theory on it, it, it if i could boil it all down to one seen in both games it's very similar yeah it's it's the late night dinner party in end walker and it's the like ramen like like a uh, hot pot cookover Aww. meal in persona 5 right those Aww, okay <laughs> those those two scenes i think in a lot of western stories would just be like oh like this just happens right like you know forget that people just want to see the action they just want to see the big dragon flying over they just want to see you know your party doing awesome cool attacks and this and that but yeah. both games take their time to make you feel like you are truly friends with these people and give you those lighter yeah. moments mm -hmm. you know like alizé pulling off the pickles off the hamburger and and graha <laughs> talking about how he's too short to reach things and you know, in Persona yeah. Five, they're like they're talking about all kinds of different things. I f I forget. Like Morgana said something about Lady On, and you pissed off Morgana because like she's he's in love with uh with On. But yeah. but you know, like there's you get to know uh, Yusuke and and other people just so much more in that game than you would mm -hmm. in you know kind of Western games. And I think if I could boil it down to the you know what makes these games special, is that comes from a real human place you know yeah that is a, a real human interaction that that people have and that it makes you feel like like you have actually experienced something alongside these fictional characters like you were friends yeah it's very immersive because it's very relatable and it's just having those yeah like you said those very real moments with your friends like those little character quirks because i really feel like most games try to focus so much on the action to keep attention, but like the little tiny details of just hanging out with your friends in the game is some of the most like just the character building, really focusing on those little things that you can connect to and having those character quirks. I I don't know. There's just not enough of that anymore, I feel. Yeah. I mean if I think about the story in Warcraft, like while I was there, I mean, I, I love, I love the Warcraft universe, but as I've kind of mm -hmm. peeled back and like looked at the Warcraft universe and the, and the world of Warcraft story from a, you know, refugees perspective for lack of a better term. Yeah. Every time I look at it now, all I see is like Michael Bay, right? <laughs> like the Michael <laughs> Bay transformers, like explosions, like big things. And then when they try yeah. to do nuance, they don't really do a good job at like the nuancey type of moments. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, so much of, of 14, is just built on that nuance and built on that emotion. And, um, as I said once, like, uh, cause I'm a seasoned gentleman and I've been through some crap, uh, and Rui Khan's like, that's just, that's just you just saying we're old. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Um, <laughs> is it, it seems like the writing Ishikawa, Yoshi P, Koji Fox, whoever's doing the writing on that, those emotions mm -hmm. are coming from, it almost feels like real experiences, like the ways in which they write the dialogue, like the, the yeah. goodbye to the first and the way in which they, they talk in that moment, it just feels mm -hmm it's hard to explain when you unless you. unless you've gone through something like that in the real world you'd never be able to write something like that to, to encapsulate that moment as perfectly yeah you're very right about that it's way too nuanced for it not to be a real thing mm -hmm. and i think we <laughs> every saw every tiny emotion 
And I think we saw a little bit of that with uh, with the Soken bit. Have, have you ever watched that? That I, I take it you have after yeah. <laughs> based on that reaction. <laughs> exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so I mean, that uh, that bit of passion just just oozes through everything that he does and and uh, into his music. Um, I just love that you feel every bit of Soken's music, every piece. You just feel everything that he put into it. Mm -hmm. Ugh. I've listened to um, Closing in the Distance on repeat and flow like every day this week. <laughs> uh, I just keep listening to these songs. <laughs> well, they take you on a journey, right? Yeah, they do. Yeah. <laughs> so too much of a journey. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we talk a little bit about spoilers? So if you're listening on the audio okay. podcast, let's let's get into full and Walker spoilers at this point, because I, I have not got to yes. talk and Walker spoilers really with anyone on this show yet. Oh, um, heck yeah, let's go. So yeah, let's uh, this is your spoiler warning. So if you're tuning out now, uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Uh, <laughs> finish the MSQ so you can come back and listen to this. So <laughs> And Walker. Oh, and Walker. <laughs> you, you had said in one of your videos that, that N Walker surpassed Shadowbringers for you. I think Shadowbringers yes. is maybe still slightly higher on my list in terms of Ooh, an overall okay. narrative. But why is N Walker to you like the best expansion story in oh, 14? One word. <laughs> God. Um, just Emmett Selk, man. Just, oh, he is one of my favorite characters of all time. Hands down. Like, I could not get enough of that at all. Like, all, all of the ancients, their whole storyline, I love the concept of them just in general. And I never expected them to take a turn like this that they did in Endwalker. But it is amazing to me just how much I mean, like, that's a big reason why I love Shadowbringers was just like you have two amazing characters that were created in this in this whole well, more than just two. But for me, the highlight was like the Crystal X arc and Emmett Selk. Like these two characters are fantastic. And the build that they had in both of the journeys in Shadowbringers and Endwalker is just like amazing to me. Like I could not I, the end of Shadowbringers just I think hit everyone so hard because you'd never expected to feel for this villain that has been like screwing up your life the whole expansion like to be turned into something so real it just wanting to be remembered can hit anyone so hard mm. it's, it's, it's a very relatable feeling so having that evolve into something more and endwalker almost made the entire expansion to me like i thought shadowbringers was still good and better up until you get to elpis and then i was like just seeing the character development between hith and emmet and vana now my only critique is like i really feel like we didn't get enough vana time unfortunately but just seeing their characters be the same like, they didn't change Emmett whenever you get to El Elpis. He's still a bitch. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see his character. Um, but you can also see exactly why he turned out the way he did. The buildup to you being able to see why he ended up the way he did in Shadowbringers is very real and very well developed. So I enjoyed that journey so much. And Hithlidaeus was also like the cherry on top to that whole relationship and arc to really draw it out of like Hith Hithlidaeus' character is literally just there to be like, this is just how great Emmett is. I mean, and Hith too. But mm. like he's there to showcase like Emmett does all of this stuff for people. He cares a lot. But his character is there to just like express that and really show it to you. Um, but yeah, like just the character development of the ancients in general was amazing for me. Now, pacing wise, I, the pacing was a huge issue for me and, and Walker on a lot of different fronts, uh, where I, that's where I enjoyed Shadowbringers a little bit more 
that I feel like the the constant progression of the light wardens was really really good and just I enjoyed every little bit but like with N Walker it's like the pacing just was like whoa whiplash a lot yeah uh so yeah that's where I did like Shadowbringers more but as a story as a whole just I still had to end up giving it to N Walker just for those extra bits of character development that I just like yearned for so it's bias <laughs> no I, I definitely feel you like I, I think that there's tremendous it's a tremendous continuation of the story right I think mm -hmm. and it's hard to say like Shadowbringers is its own little package and Endwalker is its own little package like it's it's a continuation it's still one yeah. story I think the thing for me that just hit hit me so hard in Shadowbringers was my love for the first and the crystarium and all the people yeah. there and all the, the little moments, you know, and not, mm -hmm. and not so little moments like Tesseline, like the, that they throw at you that <laughs> really makes the people feel real. Um, yeah. And the struggles of the people that I think that some of that was missing potentially at points in N Walker. Cause you're in Charlian, which is very much this overly political, like we're, we're not going to tell you anything and we're not going to help you. And a lot of, and I'm just like, come on people. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and, and the only time I feel like I really felt th the impact of like, these are, these are real people beyond the scions and beyond like the, the main cast was, um, in, uh, Thavnerian. I don't know how to pronounce that. Thavnerian. Thavnerian. Uh, Thavner. Uh, mm -hmm. and Radzat Han with, um, uh, I know I feel bad blanking on like her name. the final days scene. No, that's the final that? days scene. Definitely. And also, um, when the elephant lady gets, Aww. gets caught in the, the tower of Zot and, okay, and, yeah, and, and I'm like, thank on. goodness we rescued her. But, um, yeah. but at the same time, like she felt like a real person with real like trials and, and, and struggles and, and felt like she was there to help you. And then the, the younger, elephant guy who was carrying the baby after you rescue him for like that was some real stuff the garlem yeah. stuff i think really stood out to me too is kind of like a side i don't it wasn't really a side story but there's so many yeah. like chunks of different parts of the story that feel connected yeah. but then kind of disconnected too right whereas Shadowbringers I mean, has that ticking clock of like you getting more and more light and like you're like what's going to happen yeah. with you and and you got to go rescue Minfilia and Reen, and it just keeps escalating and, and building up. Yeah, I know um, what you're saying there. And that's why I think I prefer Shadowbringers. That and, like I said, I love the first. I Every time I go to the first, I'm like, this is my home. Like, I don't want to yeah. say screw a Eorzea, but like, I, I would rather be over there. Like, <laughs> No, me too. That's my favorite hangout spot. Like, my two favorite hangout spots are both on the first. I love hanging out in the playground area hmm. a lot. Um uh, lead Laurent, or I think mm -hmm. that's the name of it, the Pixie Land. Yeah. Uh, so I love that world, and then I still Amarat is still my favorite place to hang out. Like, but the first in general, I I loved it just for the the fantasy feel. I think was like the the biggest attraction to me because it feels more fantasy than the rest of the game does to me. Like you just have Lakeland, the purple trees, and like you you go to Ilmeg and just the colors and i don't know just the the true fantasy feel just like brought the final fantasy back for me it's like the equivalent of like if i compare final fantasy eight to nine like nine is a classic for that fantasy feel but like the rest of the final fantasy is kind of like let go of that a little bit but that's what the first reminds me of just gives mm -hmm. me that like completely fantasy world that i'm i'm yearning for more than the rest of the game but the the first is just I don't know why besides that I just love it so much. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense what you said there about like it feels like the classic JRPGs because and I think the reason mm -hmm. it does is because it is a completely different role reflection of of the source, right? Yeah. Um and so a, a different kind of reality and plane of existence and when you leave even though your story's not over Graha's story isn't over um mm -hmm. the Scion story isn't over it feels final right like a final fantasy which is the legacy of that series is that it's supposed to be that every final fantasy was the final story of that group of people <laughs> yeah. right now they've broken that quite a few times since that statement <laughs> was made with 10 2 and with all the 13 spinoffs and, and everything else yeah. um but that's why it's like a nice little package right whereas 
I, mm -hmm. I was talking about this the other day. I'm like, I think the whole journey, like beginning to end of 14 is probably my favorite story in any medium period. Um, Same. Because it's yeah. just a crazy, it's, it's crazy how much stuff that you cover and how real so much of it kind of feels in terms yeah. of the emotions that they're able to pull. But to me, like Shadowbringers is this nice little, it's part of it, but it's also very mm -hmm. self-contained, right? Because it's on That's a different true. world. And Endwalker is a great culmination to the whole journey so far. Yeah. But but Shadowbringers is a great journey in and of itself, you know. Yeah. And that's very fair. I definitely feel like almost exactly the same. And Elidibus, that whole thing just <gasps> killed me in, in that game, right? And you know, the yeah. continuation of Elidibus and and Endwalker too. I'm so looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> are you talking about the, oh the, the pandemonium stuff? Yes. Yeah, me too. I am invested in this storyline way more than any other raid series. Okay. Minus maybe Bahamut, but like, <laughs> but I'm really looking forward to where pandemonium goes. Yeah. So am I, but I mean like even just, I'm just talking about like the shadow bringers journey of a Yeah. Like through that point where you just kind of like you don't know what his end game is you don't really feel like he's the most evil Asian because he's the one in yeah. white and and he's been playing this really long game thing and then all of a sudden like he's like i'm the warrior of light and i'm gonna take you down evil dark spawn and summon all these other warriors of light from all the other reflections to come here and take you out and yeah. the ending of you know the the uh, oh. Seed of Sacrifice, or I forget what it's called. Yeah, I, I, always, I always forget the exact names of the raids. I always just remember the boss names. Um, <laughs> but when he's down there and you just see him and he's just like a little kid almost. Yeah. And, he's, oh. and, and he just wants to help. And when he's losing his memory before that, I mm -hmm. was, it was like Emmett Selk. Emmett Selk was great because he was like there hanging out with you and kind of taunting you and kind of like being your buddy, like sometimes. Whereas Elidibus yeah. just felt like, what did they do to this poor kid? And mm. and that just killed me to see to see him, you know, let yeah. go like that. That was five point three. Three. Yeah. Yeah. I I remember I cried a lot that patch. Mm -hmm. A lot. <laughs> that was very, very hard hitting. I didn't expect it like that. Like I think most people at that time thought Elidibus was going to be the villain that carries into the next expansion, like going into Endwalker. So I was just surprised that they ended his arc that quick, but it made sense. It made total sense. And it was very impactful. I did not expect the kid. <laughs> yeah. Nobody did. That was a complete shock. Yeah. I mean, and just the, the purity of, this is for my people. This is my brothers, my friends, right? It journeys end. We will meet again. And he cries. And it's very yeah. like it, the, the line, you know, uh, about like the, uh, the rain has ceased, but you're not here to see it. Like that, yeah. that line makes me think of Blade Runner, even though I'm not the biggest Blade Runner fan, but uh, like the tears and rain line there. Um, mm. And it was just such wonderful writing. I think that captures the, I used to want to be a writer and, uh, oh, yeah? and I really liked, uh, F Scott Fitzgerald stuff. So I really liked that flowery language, great Gatsby type of type of writing. And oh. <laughs> I think that's probably why that, that expansion hit me so hard too, is cause like that line. And then you also add into that too, when you say goodbye to Reen and goodbye to ever, all the people of the Crystarium, uh, and Lena comes out and gives her speech yeah. and I'm like, I'm <laughs> I cried, no joke, for like yeah. 30 minutes straight. Like I couldn't even click to the next like chat thing because I was just like, until Ishtola came in and ruined the mood. It's like, well, I guess we got to get going. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm going to have a heart attack, but thanks Ishtola. And then they changed the music and I'm like, okay, all right, like get it together again. But it felt like I was saying goodbye to people, you know, that were, my best friends that I was never going to see again. And that just, I think drudged up every memory of like saying goodbye mm. to your friends, like moving away for school or moving away. Cause you're, they're moving to another town or whatever it might be. And I think that, yeah. that, that just captured it perfectly. So 
since we're on the topic of cr- and the, on the topic of crying, uh, we can both be <laughs> crying way here for a minute. Um, uh, what what's me. the what's the moment in uh, fourteen that's made you like cry the most? Because I made a top ten of my moments through Shadowbringers, and goodbye yeah. to the first was my was my number one. Um, but what's what's the moment that you feel like hits you the hardest throughout the entire journey from ARR to Endwalker? Oh, that's a lot of story and a lot of emotions. Yeah, it's hard to go back and figure out what was my hardest hitting moment. Because I know it's like in recent memory for me with Endwalker, but I think it is down to two. After, uh, because I know I cried a lot at after Seed of Sacrifice and uh, with Graha, like we knew that we were gonna see him again, but for some reason, the way he went out just like hit me. Like, whenever it's just you have the scene with Elidibus, you finish Seed of Sacrifice, and then to finish it off, you have right after that the like you have the Crystal X arc, uh crystallizing and then like giving you the crystals to to make sure that he transfers to the source and i i cried for a long time after that that hit me that hit me hard just the combination of those two things happening in succession Mm -hmm. um that was one and then whenever in endwalker now i didn't i didn't expect to cry that bad but when whenever the the memories got erased at the end of elpis Mm. That was hard. Um, and I didn't expect it to be that hard. But the the concept of memory is something that hits very real and home for me personally. So that's why I think that it just like it took me on like this. It, it took my brain on a ride because, of course, like, you know, I'm living this life where I want to make an impact. I want to I want people to remember me um, in a positive way. But, you know, the concept of just having someone forget about you, having a friend forget about you just hits me. And I hated it. Yeah. <laughs> I hated it because I just the whole buildup of the scene after the Katissus dungeon, it's so slow. Like the memory thing is so slow. And it just, I hated it because you just know that it's coming, but you hope that it doesn't come. And I didn't want my friends to forget about me at all. And there was something so heartwarming, too, at the end of it, having Vina be the one person. And that's where all of Final Fantasy XIV happens is because she remembered and is able to fight forever. Mm-hmm. Um, just the whole concept of memory just, man, it hit me so hard. <laughs> so that was probably the moment that i cried the hardest just because of the topic hitting too close to home for me um it took me in a dark place just like thinking about you know alzheimer's like having a family like that it's just it's very real thing and hate it i hate it i hate it so much (laughs) but i did love it at the same time it's just yeah very hard hitting um besides 5.3 oh my god I have to go back because I remember in Heaven's Word, I also had a really rough moment, but it wasn't, I, I of course had a moment with Harsha Font, but I, I didn't, I cried, but it wasn't as bad. Was it the end of uh, taking down Nidhogg and, and Estinian telling you to kill yes. him and, and I was gonna you say, and Alfie yeah, are like, rip off, yeah, yeah when you and Alfie rip off the eyes off of him. Yes, <laughs> it's exactly that. Yeah, after you fight Nidhogg, just because I love Astinian. Astinian is one of my favorite characters f- for a very long time. <laughs> so that that hit me so hard because I, I also had like extra Astinian time because at that time I was a Dragoon main and I was going through the story as a Dragoon. So I did his job quest and grew up with him more outside of the story. I just was very attached to Astinian. 
and it, that I just didn't want anything bad to happen to him. And the eyes and just seeing the corruption and just the fight and then the music of the fight, the Heaven's Word song, the dragon song, like, oh, everything. The combination of the music and me loving the character. And then I just, oh, God, I, I, that hit me really hard. <laughs> yeah, that, that's number two on my list. So, so oh, really? <laughs> yeah, the goodbye to the first was number one. And then that was number two. And I'm pretty sure uh, Lydibus was number three uh, behind Aww. that. So, so like, yeah, you, you hit a lot of the, the, my top ones there. Um, but yeah, mm. I mean, the, the music, Dragon Song, just when that kicks in and like the piano kicks in and you see like Astinian screaming at the top of his lungs, like just trying to yeah. like, you know, hold in Nidhogg and everything. That oh juxtaposition God. of the chaos that's happening with the emotion and then, yeah, Horshafon and Isail, like mm -hmm. you just didn't expect that to happen at all. Nope, not at all. And gosh, that hit me very hard. I didn't want to keep playing after that, even though like everything turned out okay. I hated. I also had this like hatred for the way that they went about. Like they ripped the eyes off of Vicinian and then they threw it into the gorge. I was so <laughs> yeah. mad about it. I'm like, you didn't do anything. You just threw it down there, and somebody's going to get it, and then it's going to happen again. So I also had this like theory of like, why did you do that? <laughs> Like, every, I didn't. I just didn't want it to happen again. <laughs> every time I see that happen now, all I hear is uh, Ill Bird saying "Sloppy," and <laughs> he's just walking over to pick him up. Um, Sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, why? Why did you do that? I have no clue. So, so speaking oh. speaking of the eyes, and and that's my loose terrible segue over to Shinryu, <laughs> and therefore my terrible segue over to Xenos. So, so. One of the big one of the big complaints that I've read that a lot of people have have made about like the Endwalker story is like why wasn't Xenos a trial fight? And people are just kind of made didn't really like the the utilization of Xenos in Endwalker potentially. Yeah. What are your thoughts on on how they utilize Xenos throughout throughout the expansion? I personally did not like it, but I also understand people that do. Because um, I feel like Xenos is just one of those villains that you either vibe with or you don't. And for me, just in like the type of villains that I like, I don't particularly like characters like him. I, I don't know. I, just, eh. I get the foil to, the, to your warrior of light. Um, and I do like that dynamic. But for some reason, just the way it was implemented in Endwalker just didn't vibe with me because it was just so sporadic and random. Mm hmm uh, so like you're you're trying to go through the story, and after like uh, for example, you know, you, the moon was like the weirdest bit of whiplash ever. You fight Zodiac. After you fight Zodiac, Z Z Zenos just comes and is like, "Hmm, I'm gonna think about fighting you, but not now." And then bunnies, like just the the <laughs> the the wave in that like 20 minutes is just. I didn't need Xenos there. I didn't need Xenos in a lot of places. Like, it's not that I don't want those scenes with him, but I just felt like the places where they decided to put him in to chase you down was just the weirdest mm -hmm. thing. I, I don't know. Like I said before, I'm not a writer, but it just felt like too much of a whiplash for me whenever he would appear. And I just didn't. I'm like, no, I just not now and not ever kind of feel the end of um, whenever you come back from Elpis and you go to Garlemald to rescue them from the final days and the fighting that's there. And at the end of it, he comes and that's when Ellie say like spits her line and she uh, finally gets to him. And that was I also thought that was pretty random because he never listened to anyone and just those small words from Ali say is what poked him the most. I just felt like there was either like a lack of development there or I don't know. It just I, just, I just didn't vibe with pretty much any scene that he was in. Like I genuinely wanted more Xenos and I wanted it to make more sense. But the times where I find he found he was in a scene with you, just nothing felt natural or like a progression of his character to me mm -hmm. in my journey, at least. Um, so like, the build up at the end with his final trial i it was a cool fight 
but I couldn't really vibe with it because like the whole expansion, I just felt too disconnected. Mm -hmm. I wish you would have had part. more of a through line throughout the expansion too and, yeah. and been more constantly there. Um, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe almost, I'm trying to think like how I would have done it differently. Like maybe he's almost like chasing you down constantly, right? Like in your, mm -hmm. you're in Elpis and then like maybe he somehow finds his way to Elpis, right? And he oh, just gosh. keeps screwing up stuff, you know, like it, every chance mm -hmm. that you can get. And you're like, I'm not going to fight you, dude. Like just, you know, leave me alone. Yeah. But like, I think I get the point of his character. Yeah. Like I do. I just feel like it was implemented in a weird way yeah well and i mean it's it's such a different take and I, and I feel like that's why a lot of people think Stormblood is is one of the weaker uh storylines uh in mm. the in the in the the journey right in the whole journey yeah. even though Stormblood, i think has some really big highs and, and interesting stuff in it like Magni and sadu just the amount of shade there is perfect um I love that. <laughs> and and uh and then I think Gosetsu and uh, Yotsuyu are just like that. That whole journey is great. I think the Hien stuff mm -hmm. I like quite a bit. Xenos, I understand his purpose, right? He's very much. Yeah. I don't want to say he's like the Joker from from Batman, mm -hmm. but he is the kind of quintessential. I'm evil because I'm evil, right? And I'm evil because I just don't care. I'm like a nihilist, right? Um, so yeah, I, he just lives for the fight and that's mm -hmm. it and and i i think my yeah. un, my understanding of if i tried to had if i had to kind of like compare him to something like you know emmett selk and a lot of the Asians are just like pure grief and regret right like in and trying yeah. to make things right and that's like their core motivation it almost mm -hmm. feels like to me that if i had to compare xenos to something in the real world it would be like a drug addict right like he just <laughs> doesn't care if the world burns around him. He just wants his high, right? Um, and not to say all drug yeah. addicts have that motivation. They don't, of course not. But in that yeah. same level, like when I try to understand Xenos, it's just like even when he's he's laying there at the end uh, and you're both you know, kind of like laying there staring up at the stars like half dead. And he's just like, is this it? Like, is that is that a, like it's like the last high just wasn't what he was expecting it to be and and yeah. that disappointment um kind of finally hit him in that moment and i think that that's the point kind of his story whereas you know yeah i, I think hermes and um meteon is a much more interesting concept but it's just kind of a shame that it doesn't get introduced until elpis really yeah yeah kind of comes out of nowhere but i wouldn't how did you feel about Meteon and that whole like story at the end there? Hmm. It made sense. I wish we could have had it earlier, but I we there's no way that we could have at the same mm -hmm. time. Like I I do like the twist of like of especially the connection with like the the final days of Amaranth and our final days. I thought that that was genius personally. And just the, the dynamic of like those creatures in the final days of Amaranth were the problem, but in our final days, it's Dynamis. That's the problem. And the, I like the parallels between the two that they explored through Meteon and uh, Elpis, Dynamis, Hermes, that whole thing. So I thought that was really good. Um, I just don't, I just have a request for more, but like it, it also would be impossible because mm -hmm. there's no way we can travel to the past at an earlier point in time. Um, and Van Daniel as a character, the whole <laughs> Hermes aim on whatever, <laughs> like I, I did vibe with him. I did like him. I really, I, I understand it. And yes, it was infuriating, which I think is the point as he's like kind of a villain. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess not not in Elpis so much, but his development after that. Uh, it's God, I don't know. Because I feel very conflicted in a weird way where I like what they did. I liked Meteon. I liked... Hermes. 
but I also needed more or something else. And I don't know what that is. I think when I, when I think about Hermes more specifically than even Meteon, like Meteon is just like pure emotion, right? Like that's, that's her thing. Right. And when too much negativity comes in, if you're pure emotion, it just over overwhelms you because it's just too much. Mm-hmm. Hermes, I think, is the more interesting study there. Not so much like yes. Fa- Fan Daniel, which is just pure, pure craziness in a in a way, right? And Amon, yeah. which is like pure destruction. Um, yeah. And Asahi, uh, he shows up at the end. I, I kept questioning <laughs> myself. I'm like, why does he keep having different voices? And then it finally started to make sense. Um, <laughs> and when Asahi comes at the end, he's like, I'm sick of you. And I'm like, good, get out of here. I'm I'm done with you. That scene was great. <laughs> um, and. <sighs> I guess trigger warning if the topic of, of depression gets to you, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, you know, I think of like the whole story that they're trying to tell there with those two is really a story of depression, right? Like if it Emmett, is, yeah. if Emmett Selk and Elidibus are like pure regret and trying to make things right, mm-hmm. like Hermes is the flip side of that, right? Hermes is, he watches his creations. He keeps getting told to put down his creations. And he's like, I'm playing God with these things as if they mean nothing. And when he has to yeah. kill that one, you know, big beast, because they just deem it unworthy. It just, he's had to do that so many times that it just breaks him. Right. And yeah. I think he's, you know, it's very clear the way that they've designed him, the way that he speaks, he's a character that is depressed even before we meet him. Right. Like he is. Yeah. He is dealing with too much that to, you know, for him to handle and um, thinking about the journey that he goes on is really interesting because it does filter into Fan Daniel and it does filter into Amon, right? Like Fan Daniel is right. like, once you hit that really crazy nihilistic end of, of depression and Hermes is kind of like the beginning of that. And, mm-hmm. you know, I find that bit very fascinating because I really like the theme of the story, which is, you know, Vitra says to you, like, hold on to your friends because they are your hope and they are like your light yes, in the darkness. Versus hope. Right. And yeah. and that message definitely rang true. It just feels it felt a little bit strange to have all that embodied into a small little bird girl. Um there are people that are saying that like Meteon is Twitter. Um <laughs> yeah, I've heard, I okay, yeah. I don't know if you've heard that, heard that one, but yeah. And I'm like it kind of makes sense, right? But like hold yeah. on to your your close friends and don't let the Twitter despair <laughs> trap like get you. Um Yeah. But but yeah, I mean, I really like the themes of the story. I think I just wish I had more and I'm with you. I don't I just don't know how I would yeah. do it any differently. Me neither. I just needed I needed about like five hours more of MSQ and Elpis. But that's just mm-hmm. me wanting something that probably would not have worked out. <laughs> like I needed a little bit more Vana and I also needed a little bit more Meteon and Hermes before the switch, mm-hmm. before the development happened um, with them. Just not enough, not enough needed. Well, we all know yeah. what, we all know that what you would do and what I would do and what everyone would do is be the first thing that we do is we'd run directly to Emmett Selk and Hith and be like, "Hey, do you, do you know what just happened? Like, let <laughs> let me tell you all immediately again." <laughs> it, yeah, that's true. <laughs> let me try this again. Reset. Yeah, and I wonder if there's like some causality loop, right, where it would just keep happening over and over again to where like you're just like, "All right, I give up." <laughs> But <laughs> it'd be like, Hith, we're best friends. Emmett, like, you actually like me, but you pretend like you hate me, but you really love me. So, <laughs> but. yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, where do you think the, the story's going from here? Obviously, Emmett gave us all those lines, right? Of like, have you ever yes. been to the waters uh, beneath the bounty bitch. and, and <laughs> the, the identity of the 12 and the different reflections and everything? And I mean, he made, yeah. it, he made it very clear that there's a lot of stories to tell where do you think we're going next and where would you like to go next uh um uh the identities of the 12 that's i think the plot point that strikes me the most as being like the most interesting but there's also the personal want of because i liked the first so much i also want to explore the other reflections that are there and there's not many what five or four the other ones that are left. Um, I would like to go to the other ones. There's 14 total, right? Um, right. 
seven were destroyed in calamities. Yeah, and then... And then one was like the World of Darkness, the one that the Asians really royally yeah. screwed up. Yeah, um, they definitely fucked it up. <laughs> yeah. And then, so it's four? I think... Yeah, I think math is hard, but oh, yeah, I... <laughs> I would like to go. There, to the there other are one. there are quite a few of them, so let's just leave it at that. Less than yeah. less less than ten, like somewhere around like six ish, six to four, something like that. Mm hmm. Uh, there's, but yeah, like the identities of the twelve, everything that's still left unsaid in the source. Like, I am such an Emmett simp that I just want to do everything he said. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just like, okay, I want to go on your journey because it's also very like touching now that we have like the whole um, as, as M story, like we are as M, like the color of our souls are the same. Like Emmett feels this personal connection to us because of this relationship that he had with as M. And I find it so endearing that he chased around as M's travels. <laughs> so a part of me also wants to follow in Azam's footsteps and do exactly what both of them did. Mm -hmm. I I would love nothing more than that. But as far as like where else the story goes from here, like I have no idea where they're going to go. That was the first question I asked myself whenever Ed Walker was over. I'm like, where do we go from here? Like, mm. I'm very much looking forward to the live letter for them like mapping out the next 10 years because they're probably going to tell us like, you know, story for the next 10 years is going to be completely different direction and going this way. Maybe, I don't know if they're actually going to mention where it's going, but I know they're supposed to give us like a timetable of like, yeah. Uh... Yeah. I don't think we're going to get like the whole 10 years, right? The road. Oh no, no, no. Just like, like a direction, like, oh, maybe we'll explore more of the source. Maybe we'll do something else. Who knows? So oh. <laughs> <laughs> my theory on it is that they will uh all those little places that Emmett Mel met or mentioned seems like things mm -hmm. that they could do in like six point one, six point two, six point three, yeah. six point four. Not like you know? expansion stuff that right. or like yeah, next expansion, but like little patch things. I don't think it's big things either. And you know what I think would be really nice of a writing touch and and don't don't steal this if this is terrible more terrible than what what you're uh you're thinking about ishikawa so i'm like please do what you do uh don't listen to me <laughs> if you're even listening to this but um you know i think it would be interesting if like emmett as um solace right as the the mm. the um gar garlean emperor right uh, as the garlean yeah. founder I think it would be interesting if all those places that they mentioned on um, Etheris were things that he like messed up, right? Like things that he intentionally oh. was like screwing with just to cause chaos. And it, <laughs> I think it would be really nice to have him like voice over and was like, yeah, I was doing this stuff here. Kind of feel bad about it now. Could you fix my mess for me, please? <laughs> like, and that way you can have more like Emmett voiceovers and stuff like that. And then you can maybe have like one more moment with him at the end where he's just like, thank you for, for, Oh, uh. um, <laughs> I would love that. So I think, and then like, for me, I'm, I'm a hundred percent with you. Like, I think the next expansion should be another world. And I think the yeah. expansion of the, after that could be another world, right. In a different way. So we could just, mm -hmm. you know, like world hop and meet new people and, and, solve problems in a world and then once we've solved the problems of that world we'll move on to the next one and maybe there's an overarching theme of like the 12 on top of that mm -hmm. but i think that that would be an, an interesting way of, of doing it but again i'm biased because i like the first quite a bit and i like the kind of finality of that <laughs> story that world was just done so well ah. i just i just want to i don't know i also want to go back and visit reen and lena i wouldn't mind actually yeah. going back to the first and helping out with some new existential threat that, that's there. Um, yep, I would not be opposed. I love Lena. I think she's completely underrated character. Like, yeah. I fucking, oh, I love her so much. <laughs> Horribly underused, right? Like, uh, she has yes. she has wonderful moments. The voice actress is tremendous. Um, she's god tier. And and woefully underused. Just like I feel like Sadu. I keep saying like Sadu's tr like. Tr criminally underused too but i feel like sadu's like mm. you can't overuse her right because she's just yeah. chaos incarnate and shade incarnate right like that's yeah that's yeah. sadu um 
But like I, I don't know. Pippin's my other one too. Like I wish we had more time with Pippin because whenever I see like Pippin and Raubon and Nanamo together, and P- that moment when Pippin like throws shade at, at Raubon and he's like, yeah, but like at least I've got both my arms. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, that was a complaint I have with Edmwalker too. I love Raubon. Not mm-hmm. enough. Where's that? Where's my Raubon, man? <laughs> my my biggest complaint with Endwalker. Did you ever? And this is this will be the last thing I, I say about Endwalker because I want to be respectful of your time because I can talk about this <laughs> oh, for, no, for hours. But um, is did you did you do the um, the benchmark? Did you ever watch the trailer for that or? Oh, no, actually, I didn't do the benchmark for Endwalker. Okay. Because I was afraid it would break my PC, actually. <laughs> well, you can just watch the. They haven't posted on like the. Yeah, I should. Channel. I should watch it. Actually, I have not. So if you watch the 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 benchmark trailer, like do that after we we get done with the show. Yeah, the, I will. A lot. A big portion of that, you know, there's there's bits of like you know you're just exploring Charlian and they're showing a lot of characters walking around and stuff, but the the big like battle stuff that starts and it's kind of in the middle and then it's at the end, is you charging like the Tower of Babel and charging Garlemald. And mm. and everybody is there, everybody. Oh. Uh, Amerix there, Lees is there, uh, uh, Merle Wib is there, Connie Senna's there, Raubon's there. Um, every literally all almost almost everybody that you've encountered, Sadu, Magni, like all of them, right? Wow. Hori okay. Boulders there, like everybody is. Oh. Every, everybody is in that fight, right? And they're all like yeah. they're trying to like help you break through to get to the tower of Babel, um, which we didn't know it was called that at the time, but now that we yeah. know, like well, I'm calling it that in that epic battle scene of just like, you know, it just felt like the, a true culmination of like, Oh, these are all these people. These are all these nations we got together and we're all going in to stop whatever's going on in the tower of Babel. Yeah. When I know I I like the Tower of Babel dungeon, I kind of wish Anima was a trial, but I get why like he couldn't be a trial alongside Zodiac and Heidelin and the End Singer. Yeah. But like I thought, what they did with with uh, Emperor Varus Varus was crazy. Yeah. Like I mean, that is that was insane. That's like some messed up stuff, right? <laughs> Yeah, no one saw that coming. <laughs> no, I, I certainly didn't. Right, and, and Anima yeah. was was in the 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 story trailer, right? Like he was, and I was mm-hmm. just like, oh, Anima, that's cool. Like I, I remember, yeah. I remember that. You know, it's kind of how you look at it. And then when they're like, yeah, it's Varus's corpse, and then you're like, oh, <laughs> oh, you're like, in okay, yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, she- but it made perfect sense, and I thought it was brilliant storytelling. Right, that like these people don't have a religion, and their religion is their government, and like who's better a perfect embodiment of that made made perfect yeah. sense in this world. But you know, as much fun as it was to like be running through the beginning of the Tower of Babel dungeon, like in the in the tunnel with Pippin and and Lise and Magni and Sadu yeah. and others, right? Like, and to see them all there alongside you, I kept mm. thinking about that benchmark trailer and how much more epic it would have been if it was literally like we need everybody right everybody has to come here and help us not just not just end the the tower of babel stuff but like save everyone from garlemald and i think it would have been just a much nicer bigger moment if yeah the whole of eorzea like who has been under threat from the Garleans the entire time, not just emissaries, not just, and I love like Lucia and I love, you know, some of the other characters yeah. that were there. Um, I just wish it was everyone. Right. I'm and I think, you. and I I'm think that you. that would have had just a, a much bigger emotional punch. Same thing with yeah. when you get all the supplies delivered to you in Charlian, like to, to, oh, right. to make the trip. I think, mm-hmm. it, I think it would have meant a lot more if we had not just like the kind of, B tier players that we love show up, but also the A tier players show up too, you know? Yeah, I did love that moment though, because mm-hmm. it was really cool being like, oh wow, the 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 raid tier series that I did matters and the like the alliance raids and the regular raid series, like they tied it all together in those scenes. And I thought that was really cool. But yeah, I like you said, I still wanted the main people there too 
on top of the B B tier list. <laughs> you called it. Yeah, I mean, w watch, watch the benchmark and then like message me later and tell me what you think. Yeah. Like if 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 it, if you're like, oh, this would have been so much cooler, and I'm like, why? They already oh. had it. Like, why didn't they just put it in the game? Is is what I, I wonder, kept thinking. They, I guess, their reasoning was they're supposed to just be like taking care of those own nations for yeah. the role quests yeah so it, ma it, it makes sense right like yeah the, it does the, yeah i get it it's not like come on. it's not it's <laughs> not that's one of those moments where i i would have liked them to kind of suspend you know like the practicality of the moment of like yeah, yeah like everyone's same. dealing with their own crap and everyone's dealing with the final days in different ways like they all have to stay home and protect like what's what's going on at home that yeah. makes more logical sense but like I kind of like the pure id in my brain was like, just give me like everyone together, just all yeah, big, just big the charge. Yeah, just the scene in Garlemald. Then they can go back. Right. But, like the final days hadn't Garlemald. started at that point anyway. It wouldn't. Yeah, think about yeah, it too? the eighty-five. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they could have gone back and been like, yeah, we need to take care of the final days now. Yeah, that would have been good. <laughs> so thinking about the scions, they've kind of oh. like semi disbanded at this point. Yeah, it's semi dis totally disbanded. Like that. It, yeah, totally. <laughs> so so I was I was really happy to like see that it was like not true. <laughs> like that they're all yeah, just like, like <laughs> we're all just doing different things. Cause I'm like, I don't is much I, I keep saying like I don't want to meet like new characters, but then like I think about Reen and I think about Lena and and other characters along the journey, like Gosetsu and and uh Hien and other people. Like I want I want the Yugiri to see like those people more. Yeah. Um, so whenever they introduce new characters, I'm always very happy that they do like Hith is a mm -hmm. new character technically. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you're just very happy that they, they have new ones there, but I hope that there's, they don't go like full clean slate, you know, like next expansion where they're like, I have a feeling they will. I'm a little nervous about it too. I, I, I think that the whole point of N Walker was to wrap up every scion's character development mm -hmm. they all have gone like a full journey there's yeah. like no loose ends whatsoever so in terms of like storytelling they've already had their max development so in terms of storytelling i don't know how interesting that would be whenever they've already like we love them mm -hmm. i think what would be really nice like personally i love the thought of like having a new group that we journey with you know have and and grow with them like we did the scions and each and every one of them and you know whenever you know shit hits the fan we just like get a cameo of an old scion coming in to save the day i i like the idea of just having those easter egg moments of like oh oh my god astinian's coming in to save the day we haven't seen him in two years yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. i like the idea i i do want to journey with the scions so much but i don't see them uh keeping them around in terms of like uh, as a group and like continuing the story of Final Fantasy 14 I see them like doing more cameo type stuff kind of like Gaius yeah that's how I feel it's gonna be personally at least not it's not that I want that necessarily I just feel like it's gonna go that direction mm -hmm. yeah I think Gaius is one of those characters I wish we would have saw more of I, I understand why we did yeah. it but I wish we would have saw more of an end walker too because I the, did the sorrow of whirl it is is um yeah that that trial series is just awesome i did love the trial series yeah i i liked what they did in that oh that was so sad <laughs> it was oh, but it but it was a nice way to humanize you know the, guys, the guy yeah. that you heard you know for whom do you fight like eight million times uh, uh i still every day <laughs> yep every day forever <laughs> forever and ever but <sighs> yeah, I'm I'm interested to see like which direction they go, like or if they only bring like some yeah. some of the scions along with us, and you know the other ones kind of stay home. Like if you had yeah. to pick, if you had to pick one or two scions to stay with you on the journey, who would you pick? <laughs> no, I can't. I like all of them. Oh, I'm with no. you. <sighs> my my two personal favorites are Astinian and Graha, but like. I God, this expansion made me love the twins so much, and I just I want the twins to be with me. <laughs> yeah, mm, I love all of the scions. Like I love that I love every single character. 
Yuri Ange, God, I I would love him to join me in every adventure just for the sheer poetry of his words. Like, mm. Mm. I want everybody for their own specific reasons. But yeah, Astinian and Graha are the two characters that I'm attached to the most out of like, the Scions. Yeah. But I, I would say up there. But. I would say the twins. I think I would have because yeah, you can't separate the twins. Uh, yeah, I no, I don't think. It was a yeah. and, it's, <laughs> and they're such a good complement to one another. Graha would be like my my third there after Alfie and Alize. Um, mm-hmm. I just I just feel like Al, Alfie and my character are just best friends, right? Because we've just been yeah. like we're we started off as frenemies, now we're best friends, and <laughs> and everything's good. Um, but if I had to make a request for one more Yoshi P, uh, just add pudding way to my trust group and, and all will be, all will be good. Oh Z- Z- zombie pudding way, uh, for my trust group, please. Zombie pudding way. Oh no. <laughs> I love that. He's just in Charlie and now. Yeah. It's, it's, he's it's, just hanging there. it's hilarious that. <laughs> The, the roller coaster, speaking of the roller coaster of Endwalker, right? Like they go, like you said, Zodiac bunnies. Like, <laughs> and, uh, and I don't mean to say like bunnies is down, but it, it's a, no. it's a calmer, calmer thing than like, oh my God, we're fighting the God of like despair and death and you know, everything yeah. else. Um, and, uh, I mean, <laughs> those moments like when they say engage and you're like in this very serious moment. <laughs> And then all of a sudden that crazy, like one of the most effective horror scenes I've seen in a while, the the one where, where Meteon like boards your ship oh, and she's yeah. just like showing up different places and like flashing in front of your face. And it's just like, holy crap. Yeah. The the tonal switches, I think, do wonders for this game because you could be crying one moment, then laughing, then scared half to death. And I'm yeah, everywhere. <laughs> just a roller coaster of emotions. It is, but it's like one of the best out there. Oh, I love this game. I will forever throw my money and sub in Final Fantasy XIV. Like, I'm just here for the ride eternally. As am I. So I'm crazy enough to have started a podcast about it, you know, after diving into it two feet forward. So um, keep it up. Do it. Keep going. I just want to rescue more refugees from WoW and and from other MMOs. And I want everybody to experience this. I was trying to get my mom to play it, and she was like, "I just can't play another game." Like she, she just, Aww. she just started playing games for the first time uh, uh, last year during the pandemic, and it was Fortnite. And, oh. and uh, <laughs> don't judge me. I actually quite like Fortnite. Like Fortnite and Final no. Fantasy are the two games that I play. But uh, I play. No, that's good. Play, it's just not what I expected. <laughs> play, play with my family. Um, and and that's how we kind of keep in touch and everything so it's it's a fun thing Aww, for us but um but i was trying to get her to play final fantasy i'm like you like books right like you like stories you like game of thrones right like mm-hmm. you're gonna love this and she just doesn't want to learn a new control system because <laughs> the oh. big thing. So, <laughs> it's very intimidating it is it is a bit of a clunky control system but i'm trying to get as many people to, to try it because oh, honestly going from being an angry wow player like logging into wow every day and just being mad at the state of the game and mad at so many stuff like this has just been a joy and then when i got to the, now that i'm doing raiding and stuff and and gonna dip my toes into savage i'm like this is this is so much better because i'm not having to deal with random number generators all the time and i can kind of no. like pick the gear that i want and only have to have a team with eight people like what are you talking about like this is so much yeah so nice Aww. and and the social side of things is great so i just want to share that love with uh everybody that i meet and i need to get that shirt that says like have you heard of critically claimed uh MMO yeah, i need to get it too final fantasy 14 just so i can wear it out all the time for sure so i i'm so fortunate because my brother i've been trying to get him to play final fantasy 14 for years and as soon as sales went back up he got it so i am living again i'm just so happy because i get to like walk through the beginning of the game with my brother (laughs) Mm -hmm. he's loving the journey so far he's about to finish a realm reborn i told him to like take it slow but just reliving through somebody else has just been the height of my joy in the past two weeks yeah and 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 thank you to you and and all the streamers you know rich asman um 
who else have I've watched? I've watched Peeves. I've watched Chad Thorson. I've watched so many streamers go through mm -hmm. the journey just because I'm, I'm reliving it constantly through all of you. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that journey with oh. all of us so that we can, we can relive it again. So, and it's great that you're oh, get, getting course. to see your brother, um, experience yeah. it for the first time too. Oh yeah. And hopefully <laughs> so I can, hopefully I really want to experience it through my mom's eyes because I'm really curious as to what she would say about it. I, I will, I will hope for you. I, I believe that one day she'll get there. Yeah. So if you could ask Yoshi P last question, if you oh. could ask Yoshi P for anything in final fantasy 14, any new feature, any story bit, oh, any no. bit of content whatsoever, what would you ask him for? Oh no. <laughs> it could be silly. I don't oh. know. You know what? I actually just saw this on Twitter today. Like someone made a fantastic post. Like this is completely unrealistic. But one thing I would love out of Final Fantasy 14 is an anything roulette. And that works for people like me that literally do every aspect of the game. Like, it, it, I don't know, crafting, Eureka, if uh, go ocean fishing. Like I just want a roulette that I can click and I just go on a random job on a random place, like a randomizer button. I just want that no one else would really want it because you would have to have like every job unlocked and everything unlocked or maybe they just randomize like they see what you have unlocked in the game and the jobs that you could play and they just randomize it with what you have mm -hmm. but i would love a randomizer as soon as i saw that idea i was like yes <laughs> because i love doing everything and i can do everything i would love it <laughs> So I would love much. if they threw maps into that too. It's like you just get, yes. you, you have a chance to get thrown into a random map room. Like that would be yeah. fun too. Completely randomizer. Or you, yeah, like I said, you could also go into ocean fishing. Like <laughs> you could log in and just be like, yo, and you're in the yo Jimbo thing in the middle of a uh, gold saucer. Oh yeah. I don't do gold saucer enough. So yeah, I would love to be thrown into some random mini game in there. Like, yeah, of course. Like I, I think a randomizer would be so fun personally for me. I, I would totally do it. I'd love sure. doing mentor roulette for the randomizer part of it. Like just what fight am I going to get? <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, that would be a really cool feature. Will they ever do it? Probably not, but I would love it. <laughs> we can hope, right? Like Yoshi P might bless us one day with, with all these different ideas that, that my guests have come up with. So yeah, that's not my idea personally. I just saw it recently and I was like, yeah, that's genius. So I'm stealing that guy's idea. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, do you want to share all your social channels and Twitch stream and YouTube channel and everything uh, for, for everybody sure. to follow you from? On everywhere, I'm Crystal. Two A's, two H's. I know it's weird. Uh, and then on Instagram, it's O Crystal. But yeah, that's YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Twitch. I'm everywhere. All the things, just Crystal. <laughs> awesome yeah well, definitely give crystal a, a follow a follow wherever you would like to and if you're listening to this on spotify or any of our podcast websites i have a youtube channel so please come follow me over there i make memes do top 10 videos i'm doing some community documentaries right now too that i'm working mm -hmm. on my first one for um different things telling like the stories of like some of the people that make eorzea such a, a rich world like my first one's on one of the djs that does the house party stuff uh and his motivations behind that so really excited to get that launched for everybody and i have a, a new discord that i just started as well it's called the popoto pub final fantasy 14 community so there are some members that have already joined there so please join the group would love to have more of you out there and i'm starting to stream too i'm doing roulette streams kind of along with the randomizer thing even when i get everything to 90 i'm still doing roulette streams and i would like to run roulettes with all of you and just hang out so please follow me there popo jagaimo pretty much everywhere i'm at so thank yeah. you once once again, Crystal, for being here and of hope course. that you enjoyed your time on the Popoto Pub. It was a great time. Thank you. I appreciated it. <laughs> All right. Well, lolly ho, everyone. Take care and peace out. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Popoto Pub. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more episodes. Take care, everyone, and peace out. <laughs>